Okay, to round out our uh, session on the regulatory environment, uh, our next speaker uh, works at a CRO also, uh, but really has a lot of experience in pediatric and rare disease programs, and has a very nice background in GCP and quality on these types of uh, drugs. And so uh, Angie Robinson, who's the Executive Director of Pediatrics and Rare Diseases at Premier Research, uh, is going to be speaking about outsourcing in rare diseases, uh, obtaining an accurate bid from a CRO. Good afternoon, everyone. Let me see if I can, excellent. So just to say a little bit more about my background, um, working as an executive director, one of my roles is to cost the re request for proposals that come in at Premier Research, as well as work on the strategies for those. And I also perform executive oversight over the studies that we run in rare diseases and, and pediatrics as well. And what that executive oversight gives me visibility on is you know, where projects are, are running within our margins, when change orders have been required, and what those the reason for those change orders have been. And so I'm hopeful today that I'll send everyone away with a, a couple of nuggets of information um, by reviewing you know, what are best practices in the process for obtaining a bid from a CRO, but also working with them through the implementation of the study. I thought this topic was important because rare disease studies are not cookie cutter studies, and they require a lot of unique individualized, tailored approaches, um, and, and so the nuances of those are very critical for putting together a proposal. Um, I think that a, a partnership is, is successful when you have the completion of a mutual set of expectations, yet it's been my experience that quite quite often actually, that the budgets are not, e are not reviewed until after the contracts are signed, at, at least not with any detailed specificity. And so what I'm gonna discuss, hopefully, is to avoid those conversations that start with, it's not in the budget, and allow us to talk through those details so that both parties, sponsors and CROs, um, are considerate of this in the RFP process. These were some uh, interesting um, numbers that I had found that I think are relevant to today's presentation, the first of which is that there are 600 orphan drugs currently in the clinical phase of development. And Premier Research had done a survey which resulted that 75% of rare disease studies are being outsourced to a CRO. So these partnerships are happening with more frequency um, now than ever, and so again, recognizing the importance of looking at and enhancing this process for both parties. Uh, and the final point, which I, I think is very interesting, is that um, on average, the cost per patient in rare disease trials is 2,400% more than in regular trials. So let's talk about the process. The first piece, then, is to request the pose, proposal. And the standard um, target is going to be, I want an accurate proposal, I want something that's comparable in the bidding process, how do you accomplish that? My recommendation first is that you're going to provide as much information as possible in your request and that you're going to, where you're able, make assumptions for the purpose of the proposal, but look to your CROs to assess those assumptions. Ask them what alternative strategies should be. This way, you'll receive back something that would be comparable for the bidding process, but where you're also getting the best practices and strategies from your CRO. One of the reasons um, and I have the high-level cost drivers indicated at the bottom. I'll use enrollment as an example. Um, you know, at this phase in the study, when you're requesting the proposal, the enrollment information for any CRO to obtain, there's, there's likely an absence of a lot of data. And even doing a preliminary feasibility is only going to result in sort of rudimentary numbers for an enrollment duration. Yet, the enrollment rate and duration is going to have a huge impact on your study. It's going to help determine the number of countries and sites you're using, their overall timeline. And so the visibility really is with the sponsor at this point in the process um, for enrollment through your relationships with KOLs and investigators. And again, just sort of emphasizing why it's key for, for you to provide that information from the beginning. 
Now, it's not to say if there's information you don't have, you can't ask the CRO for, for what would their recommendation be. It's just to, to put forth as much information as you can at that point. So again, your bid is going to be, be as accurate on the return as possible. Quickly, I just wanted to show a couple of um, forms that I think we see in the RFP process, but they're important to use providing the timeline, providing the specifications, which I just discussed. But then also, um, what's very helpful often is a task and responsibilities list. This is going to delineate by task who's doing what as part of the study. Um, and you can go through each of the functional areas and, and work through this exercise. And again, because a lot of these bids are task-based, this allows you to receive the most accurate bid. So just following on to the, to the first slide on securing the basics, um, this next piece I call remembering the details. And these are things, the first category are things that are likely expected during the course of the study, but oftentimes it's been my experience that they're not, there's not enough clarification in the proposal uh, request or that these are things that are not discussed with enough detail. And I'll use the interim data transfers and clean data transfers as an example. Often, rare disease sponsors need interim da uh, data transfers much more frequently than some of the, the regular, if you will, um, trials. And so thinking about what are the abstracts and the conferences and the publications that you're going to be doing throughout the year, what are the executive reviews and reporting that you'll need to be doing, uh, in addition to the requisite annual submissions, you know, these are, are things that can be thought through at the beginning and accounted for in, the, in your proposal. Um, how clean does that data need to be? Do we need to account for extra monitoring visits or extra data management time in the proposal to allow for the data to be cleaned at the level required by you at that point in time? Um, so again, just having a dialogue and talking through these things is going to be important. Planning for the unexpected. I think it's important to account for contingencies as much as possible in the original budget. Um, you know, for example, the protocol amendment. There's and there's a lot that's associated with that. With potentially updating informed consent and asset forms, regulatory documents. Think about what may be needed with backup sites and, and other risk mitigations and incorporate those into your budgets. So the next slide then is areas that I think require more in-depth discussion with the CRO themselves. Um, and I'm going to talk through these in a little bit of detail, again, just to really highlight where the nuances for rare disease studies can differ from those of regular studies. And the first of which is the study sites. And so, as many of you know, often, well, first of all, these sites are difficult to, to locate. However, um, oftentimes you may find that while they're experienced in research, they may not be uh, truly experienced in IND or BLA research. Um, as, as well as, you know, phase two, three research. So by communicating this information with your CRO, we're able to put together a strategy that says, do we need to have some additional training visits and support visits for these sites? You know, what is going to be our site management strategy with regard to ensuring the success of the study? Study reporting is another big one that I see frequently um, where, you know, it may be that the it's necessary for the study to have a bipatient frequent update um, throughout the course of the study. But a standard reporting may just be, you know, very high level, numbers of patients in and out. And so you'll want to understand what the content is, what the frequency of those reporting um, mechanisms will be. And again, just have that dialogue from the beginning so that you don't end up in those situations where you're having the discussion that it's not in the budget. Patient recruitment and enrollment and relocation is a big one. Um, you know, understanding things in, ra in rare diseases. You know, are we going to work with a referral um, pa pathway? Do we need to secure referral letters and identify who the referral physicians are? Are we working with any kind of recruitment or, or um, informa information on disease, a company who can put together that information? And so understanding in the details what, what you're getting is going to be important. The same for patient advocacy involvement as well as site management. So you've reviewed your proposal. You've reviewed the costing for the first time. You're giving it a final look. What are the things that you need to look for in your proposal to ensure that you really have prepared yourself for the most successful study and in incorporating the best practices? 
and these are my recommendations. So the first then has to do with team communication and meetings. So it's important in rare disease studies to create an environment of learning and of cross-training, and this is for the duration of the study. So thinking about whether or not additional meetings should be added to talk with the CRAs, to get feedback on the um, investigator and, and patient experience. Should you incorporate some sort of investigator motivation plan or um, engagement plan? And so this would be a scenario where you decide on study ambassadors who can be in touch with your sites either on the telephone or doing local visits, again, to support these relationships that for many times are going to be long-term relationships over the course of your development process. With um, continuing in site selection and management, you know, oftentimes the time between an investigator meeting and the first patient in can be substantial, even the time between patients. And so taking into account what you may need for retraining the sites, knowing your protocol and your sites well enough to determine are these, you know, visits that can happen over the phone or do these need to be face-to-face -face visits, again, um, you know, nuances that, that should be discussed. For medical and safety management, um, it's important to do an early review of the data. This is particularly important in natural history studies as well, where you're really, you have a, a large volume of data and data points, and you're trying to get an understanding of, of what the data looks like. Whether this data is being reviewed by a safety committee or whether it's being reviewed by um, you know, the, the medical staff, medical monitor and safety staff, this is something that I recommend incorporating into, into your budgets early. And then program considerations. Are you running a program of studies? Can you visit sites and, and monitor multiple studies? Are some of the documents or database information reusable? So talking these things through with your CROs and identifying places where money can be saved, um, obviously, is going to be a best practice. So for the next phase then would be implementation. So you've finalized your budget, um, you've talked through all of the nuances, you feel comfortable with what the um, scope of work is that you're going to be receiving for the duration of the trial, and now you're looking to, to work through um, the, the execution phase of the study. I put this slide together actually through um, feedback that I've received over the years from some of the project managers that I've worked with in rare disease studies and, and some of our experts at Premier. And the first thing I always hear is to have realistic expectations. Now, I realize that's easier said than done, but I think that this can be done somewhat through the use of the second bullet point, which is going to be open and frequent communication. And so by sharing with your partner, you know, what your longer term goals are, what are some of the key milestone dates uh, for you within your company, then they can provide feedback on what, what their services are, what um, capacity they have to get this done, and again, the most realistic expectations can be put together. You're going to want to be as, as thoughtful in the study planning, and I think I've already talked about that quite a bit with having those upfront discussions in the, in the proposal process, um, but certainly having detailed um, program timelines and study timelines is important. It's important for any study, not just in rare diseases, but you know, I've seen studies that look to uh, close a study and submit to FDA while their phase two or three studies are still ongoing. And so in that type of example, there are a lot of moving parts. There, it's not just locking a database, but locking an, a database with active patients. And so by having a very detailed back-end timeline, you're helping to secure the success of your study um, and again, uh, implementing best practices. It's important to have strong regulatory support, which I think we've heard um, a couple of times throughout the day, as well as maintaining the PI and site relationship support. Okay, and in summary, and I'm getting us, I think, back on time. Um, you know, I, I do think that the most satisfying relationships are, are through those mutual expectations. And so taking time up front to discuss with your CROs, um, you know, what, what your needs are and what your expectations are so that they can be responsive to that is going to be key. Always thinking about where you want to end up, having the end in mind, 
um, and incorporating best practices is key, um, as well as having open and frequent communication, not only through those early stages, uh, but through the duration of the trial. Okay. Okay, thank you, Angie. I, I have a, yeah, please. That's great. So I have a question for you, and maybe we have one uh, time for one from the audience. Um, so in rare, rare diseases, right, there's always that balance between trying to get centers of excellence that can do the best clinical research, but realizing that they may only be able to enroll, you know, one or two patients in their area. So how do you balance the idea of trying to have good quality sites, uh, but without having, you know, 80 of them around, you know, the country. Uh, for example, our program, we had one site to do our phase 2B. We flew every single boy uh, weekly to a site in Columbus, Ohio to get the best quality. So this is something all of the rare disease companies deal with. How would you, how do you try to balance that as a CRO when you give advice? I would, I would say the most important thing is to be prepared to make an investment in your sites. And so while you're looking to have certain centers of, of excellence where what's important is gonna be that knowledge base of your investigators. And so you know what we've done even here just recently is at the investigator meeting, we had all of our investigators together and someone from our QA department did a GCP certification as, you know, as a first step. And then beyond that, we incorporated you know, what's gonna be important for initiation visits and follow up so that you can invest and turn as much as possible sites into their own centers of excellence. Great. We have time for maybe one question from the audience. Any questions for Angie? Okay, thank, thank you very you. much.